Okay, so once sensation has occurred, so our sensory receptors have picked up that information from the outside world and, and sent that to the brain. Um, the next step is then perception. So this is where we make meaning out of that information. So perception is the organization, interpretation, and conscious experience of sensory information. Um, so going back to my earlier example, if you you know hear a, fo a, a sound um, or you hear a ringing sound, that part is sensation. Knowing that it's your phone versus the doorbell is perception. Now, there are two ways that sensory information can be processed, and they are bottom-up process processing and top-down processing. Um, as it says here, bottom-up processing is data-based. We are collecting data from the outside world, and we are making meaning out of that incoming information, that incoming sensory information. Um, so we are literally building this perception out of that sensory input. We are not using any prior knowledge, any um, prior experiences to make meaning out of that. We are just making meaning out of what is incoming. Um, I will give you an example of that in a second once I've defined top-down processing. So on the other hand, this is now knowledge-based. So we are using past experiences and our knowledge and our thoughts to understand um, and make meaning out of sensory information. So we're using that available knowledge, experiences, and thoughts. Um, this explains, you know, if you're ever on the phone with someone and, you know, maybe they cut out, they're in a bad area, and, and part of the conversation cuts out, you can normally still make meaning out of what they're saying. As long as it's only a few words that you missed, you, you usually can make sense of that. And that's because of top-down processing. Your brain kind of thinks, well, okay, I have a good idea of what should go here and it will input that information for you. So it's how we make sense of things when there's information information missing. Um, another way that I can explain this is if you think about when you type a few letters into your phone or, or in Google, um, it offers to complete the word for you or to complete the sentence for you. Um, that's essentially what's happening with top-down processing. Your brain is saying, okay, I think I know what comes next, and it's giving you the answer. The difference is that with predictive text um, or with Google, it gives you the option to either use what they suggest, um, or you can say, no, that's not what I'm trying to say, and you can change it. Our brain doesn't always do that. Our brain will jump to conclusions, um, and as much as that can be a really useful shortcut, it can also mean that we make mistakes. We can be wrong. Um, so something that we'll be looking at is, is some of the ways that that can happen, how we can can make mistakes. Um, and we're going to be looking at the different factors that influence that. Um, but to give you an example, let me, if I put two lines here. Okay, you've got no context here. There's just two lines. If you see that as two lines, you're using bottom-up processing. You're looking at what's there and you're saying, okay, all I see are, are two lines. Can't make any more meaning out of that than that. So that's bottom-up processing. You're using the data in front of you. However, if I do this, those two lines now become the number 11. They now have additional meaning, and at this point you are using top-down processing. You are using the context and your prior knowledge of numbers to interpret those two lines, okay? Um, so moving on to the various factors that affect how we perceive something. Um, one factor is going to first of all be whether the stimulus is strong enough for it to be sensed in the first place. So in other words, whether or not the stimulus meets the absolute threshold. If it doesn't, if sensation is not occurring, then perception can't occur either. Um, so remember that the absolute threshold is the smallest amount of a stimulus needed to be detected at least 50% of the time. And I mentioned before that the reason it's 50% of the time is because there are lots of other factors that can influence whether or not the incoming information is detected. So basically our thresholds can become higher or lower depending on the situation. So there is this theory, the signal detection theory, um, that suggests that the threshold for detecting inf incoming information depends not only on the, on the stimulus itself, so for example how bright something is or how loud something is, um, but also other factors. Um, so those other factors 
include the level of background stimulation and then the biological and psychological characteristics of the, of the perceiver. When we're referring to the level of background stimulation, um, to give you an example, if you are in a really bright room and your phone lights up, you may notice it, you may not. Probably is going to depend on whether you're looking at it at the time. However, if you're in a really dark room and your phone lights up, you are going to notice it because there's much less background stimulation. So you are much more likely to perceive that light. Um, again, if you're in a, a really, really quiet room and your phone rings, you will hear it. There's very little background stimulation. But if you are somewhere that is, that is extremely noisy, there is so much background stimulation, you are much less likely to perceive your phone ringing. Um, when we're talking about biological and, and psychological characteristics of the perceiver, I've got a couple of examples here. So state of consciousness. Um, an example would be when you're feeling tired, right? We spoke about the, the different levels of consciousness a couple of weeks ago. Um, and one of them is how, you know, how drowsy you're, you're feeling or whether you're daydreaming, um, or whether you're asleep. So when you, when your level of consciousness is much lower, when you're tired, you are less alert. You are much less likely to perceive things because your, um, level of awareness is much lower. Um, an example of health, when you have a cold, you're much less able to pick up different smells. Um, and then also your emotion, the mood that you're in at a, a given point will affect the information that you attend to and, and how you perceive things. You know, when we're in a good th a good mood, things that may sometimes irritate us are less likely to. Um, we may perceive something more positively just because we're in a good mood. Whereas when we're in a bad mood, we're more likely to perceive things negatively because we're in that, that negative state of mind. Um, an, an example would be if you're walking down a, you know, a really dark street alone late at night, you probably will notice the smallest sound or the, the, the slightest uh, sign of movement. Um, and you wouldn't notice that during the day because you're not alert to that. But at night when you're by yourself and it's dark, um, you're much more on edge and you're more likely to notice all of those small, small um, sounds and small signs of movement. Um, now, what this last point is really demonstrating is the influence of motivation on perception. Whether or not we perceive something and how we perceive something depends a lot on our mo motivation. So, for example, when you're hungry, you are motivated to eat. That is going to make you much more likely to perceive the smell of food than when you're not hungry. Um, or an example, I, I've, I've spoken about this before, uh, parents with newborn babies, they are likely to wake up to the slightest sound. They might completely sleep through a siren um, going past the house, but they will wake up to the slightest sound of their child crying because they are motivated to do that, to protect that child. Um, and so they're much more likely to perceive that. Um, also related to this is our, you know, our motivation can also cause us to perceive things that may not even really be there. So, um, for example, you know, if you're waiting for a really important phone call or a really important text, you may think that you keep feeling your phone vibrate or you think that you hear it and then you look at it and nothing's happened, but you are so motivated to notice that when it does happen, um, that you, your brain kind of tricks you and makes you think that you're feeling it or hearing it when you're not. Um, now, another factor that will, uh, will affect whether we perceive something is whether we are even consciously aware of the sensation occurring in the first place, um, or how strong the physical sensation is. And that has a lot to do with how sensory receptors respond to incoming information. Um, so if a stimulus is constantly there or it's ongoing, our sensory receptors will gradually adapt and become less sensitive to it. That is called sensory adaptation. So for example, if you have ever gotten into a really, really hot bath, um, you would notice that gradually you got used to the temperature. It feels like it's it's the temperature's going down. In reality, it's not going down that quickly. It's just that your sensory receptors are adapting to the temperature. Um, or you might have noticed that if you spend long enough in a dark room, your eyes eventually adjust so that you can see more. Again, that is sensory adaptation. Um, or you might have noticed that if you're in a really, really quiet room, you'll initially hear the 
clock ticking, um, or maybe it's the sound of the AC that you can hear, but eventually over time, you won't notice those sounds anymore. They are still there. That information is still being received by your sensory receptors, but your sensory receptors have adapted. They become less sensitive uh, to that stimuli um, so that you're less likely to notice it. Um, this is important because without sensory adaptation, we would liter literally um, be bombarded with sensory inf information constantly. You would constantly feel the pressure of clothes on your body. You would constantly hear all of these little different sounds that are around you. Um, and so instead, our sensory receptors adapt to constant stimuli um, and become less sensitive to them so that we're not being bombarded with so much information. Um, so for example, uh, it, it, you know, if you don't usually wear a watch and you start wearing one, that's new information that initially you are going to be aware of um, and you're going to feel that. But over time, as those uh, receptors adapt, you'll be less aware of the feeling of the watch that you're wearing. Okay. Um, now, something else that I want to highlight is that our perception is not always correct. Um, you know, we, uh, we're humans, we make mistakes, and that includes the way that we interpret sensory information. Um, and there are a lot of different ways that that, that that can go wrong. One way that we can see this is through illusions. So an illusion is a perception that does not match the incoming sensory data. And as a result, the representation of reality that we perceive is actually false. Okay, so we have this incoming sensory information, but the perception that we have uh, doesn't match that incoming information. Now, how we perceive something is largely affected by the, the context, the surrounding situation, the expectations that we have of it. Um, and so actually, I have an example that would demonstrate that, but before I do that, um, something else I want to highlight Illusions are not the same as hallucinations. And I really want to emphasize that because we are going to be looking at hallucinations later in the semester. And, and I don't want you to get these two confused. Um, a hallucination is when perception occurs, but external there is no external stimulus. Okay, so you're seeing something, you're hearing something, you're feeling something, but there is no external stimulus creating that. So perception is happening, but sensation is not. Okay, you're not actually sensing anything and yet there is perception. Whereas with an illusion, sensation and perception are occurring. An external stimulus does actually exist, you're just interpreting it wrong. Now, um, okay, so moving on to my example. Um, an example that shows how context can, can cause these illusions is the Ponzo illusion. Um, so, this is called the Ponzo illusion because there was a psychologist in the early 20th century called Mario Ponzo um, who demonstrated this. Um, he basically suggested that um, our mind will interpret the size of an object based on the background. So in other words, based on the context of that object, based on what's going on around it. And the way that he demonstrated it was through, through this illusion here. Um, so if you look at this, it almost looks as if this line here is much longer than this line here. In reality, they are exactly the same. So your perception that this is longer than this is an illusion because they're not. The reality is they're exactly the same. But the reason this occurs is because if you look at the background, this kind of looks like train tracks. When you have parallel lines like this going off into the distance, it starts to look like they are converging. So as a result, our mind looks at this and thinks, well, these lines are converging, converging. they're getting closer together, even though, again, they're not. Um, this line here is overlapping. So we've got this line here is in between the, uh, sorry, I just told you that they're, they're not converging, whereas in this drawing, they actually are, um, which is why you have this line here in between these and this line overlaps. And as a result, our mind says, OK, well, that line must be longer, even though it's not. So the background is causing us to see that as longer in the context. We have more examples of this. Um, but first of all, um, here, let me go to this. Um, now, thanks to social media, there are now lots of examples of illusions that demonstrate how people can be looking at or hearing the same stimulus, but those people will perceive it differently. Um, 
these types of illusions usually occur when the stimulus is perceptually ambiguous. So meaning it can be, see, be perceived in more than one way. So as a result, you're, you know, if it's ambiguous, your brain doesn't have enough information to make an interpretation you know, purely off of the stimulus properties itself. And so it uses top down processing, uh, because it can't use bottom up to find a best fit between what's heard and what's expected. So one example, uh, uh, a famous example of this is the the Yanni or Laurel debate. Um, there is a video here. And it's also you can pause this. And if you look below, um, you should see a list of videos connected to this this video, this PowerPoint, um, and you'll see the Yanni or Laurel one, and I recommend pausing it and just listening to that video, and they go into a lot more detail than I will hear about why this occurs. Um, whether or not you perceive the word Yanni or Laurel really depends on the properties of the sound itself. Um, at least usually, uh, most sounds such as L and Y are made up of several different frequencies at once. And so the frequencies of the Y, in this case, what someone has done is um, artificially made those frequencies higher, and they've taken the frequencies of the L sound and they have dropped them. And so what they've created is this ambiguous sound. And so part of what determines whether or not you hear Yanni or Laurel is whether or not you attend to the high frequency sounds or the low frequency sounds. If you are attending to the lower frequency sounds, then you are going to hear Laurel. If you are attending to the higher frequency sounds, then you will hear Yanni. Um, obviously, it's not just what you're attending to. Um, it depends on the device itself that you are listening to, uh, listening to it on. Um, that will influence the frequency of the sound. Although I will add that usually if we were in class, I would play this for all of you. And even though we would all be listening to it on the exact same device, you would all still hear different things. Um, part of it is age. Um, age influences the frequencies that you hear, and we'll talk more about that soon. Um, but even again, in a classroom setting where most of you are usually the same age, you see, see still see these various, uh, there's this variation in what people hear. Um, so one of the other factors that will influence what you hear is then again, we're coming back to context. Your brain uses its sur the surrounding cues to determine the interpretation. So it makes sense of what it hears um, based on the information that it has accessible in that moment. Um, and so in this situation, whether or not you hear Yanni or Laurel could also depend on um, the, the prior experience um, leading up to hearing that sound. So, you know, were you listening to music before? Were you talking to someone? Were you in a noisy room? Um, the prior information before, have you been primed? So if I didn't tell you it was Yanni or Laurel, you might hear something completely different. But because you know that it's Yanni or Laurel, you are automatically primed to hear one or the other. Uh, it will also depend on the amount of attention you're putting in, the effort you're putting into what you hear. Um, it can also depend, and this this is probably really what explains the differences within a classroom setting where everyone's hearing something different. Um, it can depend on your first language. Uh, it can also depend on your cultural background, your the taste, your taste in music, what you usually listening listen to, the types of frequencies your brain usually hears. Um, so there are a lot of different contextual factors that will influence whether or not you hear Yanni or Laurel. Um, but the main point that I want to make here is that the reason we hear different things is because it's an ambiguous sound and our brain has to basically guess. It has to take a stab at, at figuring out what it hears. Um, so you get these variations. Um, as I mentioned just now, you know, what you've been primed for will influence what you hear. So you are primed to hear Yanni or Laurel. You're being told it's one or the other. Um, one of the best examples that really demonstrates how our expectations can influence what we hear is this brainstorm or green needle thing. Um, again, pause the video, listen to it. But before you do, let me explain what to do when you watch it. Um, as you're watching it uh, or listening to it, think to yourself, either brainstorm or green needle and keep switching it. And what you'll find is that whether you think brainstorm before you hear it or whether you think green needle before you hear it, that is what you'll hear. I've done this a lot of times and I change up what I think each time and it changes with what I think. Um, and again, you're, it's an ambiguous sound. Your brain does not know what it's hearing. And so if you tell it, you know, you're about to hear brainstorm, it will say, okay, 
And that is what it will perceive. If you say you're about to hear green needle again, that is what it will perceive because it doesn't know by itself. So it's using your expectation or what you're telling it to interpret the sound. Another kind of cool illusion um, is, is known as the McGurk effect. Um, so, you know, as, well, every species has a dominant sense. And one of the dominant senses for us um, as humans is vision. Our, our vision um, is much more important than, than many of our other senses. And the, Merc, the McGurk effect really demonstrates this. This occurs when the visual information you are hearing and the audio information that your eyes are receiving, uh, sorry, that your, the audio information that your ears are receiving do not match. So you're hearing one thing, but you're seeing something else. And the fact that they don't match, your brain wants to correct that. And so it changes the sound to match the visual information, not the other way. It's always the the, the visual information that takes priority. Um, and so what you'll see in this video, again, pause it, take a look. Um, You'll, you'll see some, you'll hear this sound, but there'll be different videos or different images of this person uh, basically say, saying this sound, well, sometimes they're saying ba, I believe, sometimes they're saying ba, they sound, they, they change the way that their mouth is moving and depending on how, depending on what you hear, that the way their mouth moves will then match that. Um, it's, it's hard to, to describe without having it in front of me. So just t take a look on the, at that video and you'll see what I mean. Okay, moving on to another illusion. Um, this is another famous illusion called the Muller Liar illusion. Um, and if I ask you to look at these two lines here and I ask you, you know, which one is longer, most of you would probably say it looks like this one is longer. In reality, it is not. They are exactly the same. Um, but because they have, the, because of these arrows on the end, that is what makes it look longer. And so again, if you then look at this image here and I ask you a C or D longer, because you have the, these lines here, that makes this look longer. Although again, they are exactly the same. Um, part of what will also make this look longer is we know in, in, real life, you know, that length of that wall is going to be longer than the length of, of this side of the window. Um, but in reality, in this, in this image, they're exactly the same. Um, now, this is one of the theories is, is that culture can have um, an influence on how we perceive things. And so they actually conducted a study to test the carpentered world hypothesis. Um, and, and so this idea that people from different cultures will experience this illusion differently. Um, and what they found is that is that is true. People from carpentered world, so that is us, um, we live in, in a Western culture where most of the buildings have bright angles. And so that's what's well, considered by a carpentered world, um, we are more likely to perceive this illusion, to see this line, or sorry, this line longer than, as longer than that one. Whereas people in, from cultures where they live in, you know, more round buildings, or they're around a lot of more, of more circular buildings, they are less likely to experience this illusion. A few more factors that I want to mention that affect our perception, and some of these are things we've spoken about before. Um, the first is attention. So what are you attending to? That is going to influence whether you perceive something. Um, so if you remember selective attention is where we attend to a certain stimulus um, and we filter out everything else that's irrelevant. Um, so remember, this is the one of the examples is the cocktail party effect. You're at a party, you can, even though there's a whole bunch of background noise, you can selectively attend to the conversation that you are having and block everything else out. Now, obviously, you will perceive whatever it is you're attending to, you are not going to perceive the things around you because you are not attending to them. Um, and then again, this links to inattentional blindness. When we are selectively attending to something, we become blind to things around us. So remember, inattentional blindness, we, we're looking, but we're not seeing. You can be staring directly at something and not see it because you're selectively attending to something else. Um, and so this is the example for this was the gorilla video that you all watched where you were watching the basketball being passed back and forth. Um, 
And uh, some of you saw the gorilla, some of you didn't because you were attending so much to the basketball that you that you couldn't see the gorilla. So you didn't perceive the gorilla. Okay, so whether or not you perceive something depends on what you're attending to and what you're blind to. Um, your beliefs, your values, your prejudices will also influence um, whether you perceive something or how you perceive something. Um, so an example, uh, there was a study that found that people who have positive attitudes towards low fat foods are more likely to rate foods with a low fat label as tasting better than people who have less positive attitudes about low fat foods. Um, there was also another study similar to that where they took two bottles of wine, exactly the same wine, but they removed the labels and participants were told that one bottle of wine was really expensive and the other bottle of wine was really cheap and then they were asked to rate how they tasted and the one that they were told was really expensive, they rated as tasting better than the one that was supposedly cheap. Even though the wines were exactly the same and tasted the same, their perception, their taste perception was influenced by their expectations about the wine. People assume something that's more expensive is going to taste better. Um, your life experiences, so that's just what we saw on the last slide, slide there, you know, really with culture affects how we perceive things and whether we experience certain illusions. Um, and then the last thing here is neurology. So let me go to the next slide because what I'm referring to with neurology is basically how um, the activity within our brain and structures within our brain influence our perception. And if something goes wrong with those areas of the brain, that is going to influence our perception. So there are a couple of perceptual disorders that I want to talk about. Um, the first is called prosopagnosia. Um, another word for this is face blindness. So this is an inability to recognize the faces of familiar people and sometimes one's own face. Um, some people might have difficulty recognizing both uh, uh, the faces of other people and themselves. In some people, you'll see that they might be able to recognize the faces of others, but not themselves or, or, or vice versa. Um, Someone that had this, and uh, someone I'm a, I'm a very big fan of, and I really, I've, I've recommended his work before, but Oliver Sacks, he had prosopagnosia, um, and he had difficulties recognizing his own face. Um, now, the reason this occurs, if you look at this picture here of the brain, um, in the temporal lobe here, this highlighted part is called the fusiform gyrus. This is the part of the brain that becomes activated when we look at a face. It's what allows us to recognize the face of others and to recognize our own face. Um, and so this perceptual disorder can actually occur in one of two ways. Um, it could be acquired prosopagnosia, which means that it's due to some kind of brain damage um, or for some reason that part of the brain might be deteriorating. Um, and for some reason it's just not working right. With developmental or congenital prosopagnosia, this is something that appears during childhood. So this is, they, they are essentially born with this. Um, and so you start to see that developing in childhood rather than it suddenly being acquired due to some form of brain damage. The second perceptual disorder, there is a video on. So again, you can, um, well, actually, this is the last slide in this video. So after I, I go through this, you can um, watch that video. It's, it's a really cool video that explains how this, uh, the different versions of this that can occur. And I really recommend it. Um, synesthesia is where our senses become mingled um, or so for some people, this is actually a very rare disorder. It, uh, it's thought to occur in about 4% of the population. Um, and so what happens is one sense will evoke another sense. So um, in this example, you can see here, you know, the letters have a color. So all the S's are pink um, or numbers have colors. For some people, music might um, have colors or it might have a taste. There are people that report, certain, report that certain names have a taste for them. Um, so somehow these senses are becoming mixed. One theory, no one's really figured it completely out yet, but one theory is related to something that we will talk about when we get to human development called synaptic pruning. So essentially what happens is when we're born, we have, uh, we go through this period of time where our brain is creating all of these different connections between neurons. Some of those connections we need to keep, they're important. Some of them are random connections that we are not going to need. And eventually, um, in, during childhood, we go through this phase of synaptic pruning where if there are connections in the brain between neurons that aren't used, they are lost, okay? So anything that we don't need gets lost. And it's thought that in people with synesthesia, that 
synaptic pruning maybe isn't happening or isn't happening um, in places where it should. And so you have these connections between senses that don't really need to be there, but that remain. Um, so that's one theory for, for how that's occurring. Um, but please do take a look at that video and it will explain the different types and, and you know, again, talk about why this could be happening.